Okay. Is it working? I don't know if it's working. I think it was just really quiet. All right, everyone. I think we'll get started here pretty quick. This is, um, it's a full house and I don't know about you, I feel it heating up. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, so no suit jacket for me tonight, but that's okay. <laughs> um, welcome everybody tonight. And uh, I'm gonna try and play around with the pillars, but I apologize if I can't see all of you. Um, very pleased to see all of you here tonight. My name is Brooke McMurchy and I work with the Provincial Columbia River Treaty team. Uh, and I will be your facilitator for this evening. Um, hands up, how many people have participated in these Columbia River Treaty engagement meetings before? Awesome. And hands up, who's new to the treaty or the process? That's really awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming and thanks to those who have followed the process through. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so before we get started tonight, uh, I want to take a minute to acknowledge our respect for and gratitude to the Columbia Basin Indigenous Nations on whose traditional territory we're holding this meeting tonight. And I'd actually like to welcome uh, Natalie Allard, who's the cultural lead with the Tanaha Nation, to provide a welcome for us tonight. Thank you, Natalie. I'm very, very happy uh, to be here tonight with all of you. And then to be in this part of our territory, it means a lot. And to see uh, the great turnout and especially all of the young faces as well too. So you're going to hear uh, from a lot of my colleagues and everything tonight on all of the great work that we are currently working on and just keep in mind that just because it's indigenous led does not mean that we're not looking um, for input to collaborate and everything because all of our values do align so uh, thank you thank you Natalie um, so I'll take you through a bit about how the evening's going to go, but before we do that, um, obviously there's food at the back. P please feel free to get up and grab more if and when you need it. Um, there's not tons of room to move around, but if you do need to stand up and move around, please do. Uh, and the washrooms are out the door here. Ladies, I believe, is straight up and then a little to the left, and men's is around the corner past the sign I think that says bar. Um, and what else? I think that that's about it. We are, our evening tonight will start, we've already had kind of some welcoming remarks. Uh, we'll start this evening with um, a, a few comments from our local government committee representative here, Ramona Faust. So she'll share uh, a little bit about what the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee has been up to. We'll then move into an update on the Columbia River Treaty negotiations. And we have a member of the Canadian negotiating team joining us via web conference from Ottawa. Her name's Lynn Panaya. Uh, and we'll, we also have Kathy Eichenberger here who leads the BC part of the Columbia negotiating team. Uh, and then we also have the ability to hear from Natalie again, as well as Nathan Matthew, uh, both who represent the Indigenous Nations as observers on, uh, as Columbia River Treaty negotiations continue. So we'll get to hear their perspective as well. We will then move on to hearing an update on the Indigenous-led work to address uh, ecosystems in the Columbia Basin. Uh, in addition to uh, the, the Indigenous-led work on exploring the feasibility of bringing salmon back to the Upper Columbia. So we'll hear an update on that. After the uh, presentation on ecosystems, we'll move into a bit of a table discussion on that work in particular. So the ecosystem work is, is certainly a work in progress uh, and the people involved in that pro process really want to know whether it's going in the right direction. Um, you'll hear, so there's a gentleman, Michael Zimmer, who's going to be presenting here. He's with, he's a biologist with the uh, Okanagan Silks Nation. Uh, he, he wants to know, as well as the rest of the team, is this work going in the right direction? Uh, are the goals and objectives that he lists out in the presentation the right ones to be focusing on or is there anything missing? So we'll get you guys to do a bit of, of work at your tables with that. Um, and then after that, we will wrap up the evening with an update on what the province has been doing to address some of the other key community interests that we've heard throughout our 
consultation process. Um, one in particular we heard across the basin, uh, especially last year when we did these meetings, the need to acknowledge what was lost when the dams were created. Uh, we heard that loud and clear, the need to acknowledge what was lost and enhance or maintain what remains. And um, my colleague Ingrid Strauss will share the details of a project that she's been working on uh, that hopes to begin to acknowledge those losses. She's also been working on a number of other projects uh, and she'll be able to explain those to you as well. So we've got a lot of information. Um, you know, in past consultation, we've come to you and we've said, what is really important to you? What do you care about? What do you want to see included in a modernized Columbia River Treaty? Uh, and we've been going around the basin in this round of meetings to share the work that's been done to address those community interests. So there'll be chances for questions and comments throughout. We'll have a table discussion to, to get your feedback on the ecosystem work. If you have any other questions, comments, or input, please feel free to write them on the participant forums at your tables. There's also, there should be little post-it notes, and if there's not, just find whatever scrap of paper you have, and please mark them down, because we do, uh, we need and we appreciate your input uh, in this process. So thank you all once again for coming, very much appreciate it, and I'd like to turn it over to Ramona Faust. Um, Oh, there she is back there, who will share an update on the CRT Local Governments Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is a great um, full house. Um, I would also uh, like to thank the um, community members that have participated in the past and contributed to um, our interests and concerns uh, from the basin perspective. Um, I'd also like to thank the BC team and fe federal negotiating team members for making themselves available to the basin and available to the local governments committee on a regular basis. Um, we are updated um, uh, very soon after um, they finish their last rounds and it's a great service to you um, because we can uh, respond then uh, as you have told us in the past. Um, I'd also like to welcome members of our um, uh, Columbia Basin Regional Advisory uh, Committee, which is a citizen-based, broad representation uh, committee that meets um, and adds context to um, the work that the local government committee does, as well as uh, informs um, uh, the negotiating team as well. So in the room are um, Natalie Allard, Nathan Matthew, Ross Lake, Audrey Reppin, Greg Utzik, and Dwayne Boyer. So you can wave and you can talk to them about what they do um, at a break or afterwards. Uh, so I'm just checking to see if the presentation is there, and it is. Okay. So um, what has been our role? And uh, I would also, uh, I hope she's still here because I wanted to mention Deb Kozak, there she is. So um, when I say our role since 2011, uh, Deb was one of the inaugural um, members of the local government committee, uh, definitely was um, formulative in its existence, um, very passionate about it, and was the co-chair uh, of the committee. And I'm very happy to see that you're here and happy. she's a wealth of information. Um, so our role has been to ensure that Basin residents um, and local elected officials increase their knowledge um, and have opportunities to be actively engaged because that was the missing ingredient the last time that this topic was, um, was uh, before the Government of Canada and the United States. Um, and it's to build uh, understanding of regional views and values um, with the provincial government and uh, federal agencies. Um, it's to advocate for specific regional interests, which is why it's important that you also have input. And it's to work collaboratively with our local MLAs and MPs and um, 
uh, Minister Conroy has been uh, very available to us and we have been very fortunate to have her input. Um, and so um, I think that um, we were very fortunate to jump on this when we first heard about the the possible possibility of um, renegade renegotiation or or not. So who are we? Well, this electoral term, uh, our members are uh, Linda Worley, uh, the REB director, uh, chair, and um, Diane Langman from um, the village of Warfield. And as you can see in front of you, um, it's an illustrious list of uh, members from the RD, from all of the uh, electoral um, air, dis, regional districts and ele electoral areas and municipalities, pardon me. Um, and we're all appointed uh, to um, this role on a, uh, a four-year basis. So our activities, uh, if you've uh, been to one of these before, you know that we um, have conducted community meetings uh, from 2012 and uh, have done subsequent meetings um, up until now. Here we are again. Um, we've submitted recommendations um, and we support CBRAC, which is the acronym uh, for the Columbia Basin Re Regional Advisory Committee. And, um, so I think I'll just provide some highlights from the list, which is we've been listening and we've been learning. Um, and um, we have residents who are experts and we have experts who are residents and we've been very fortunate at the talent that we have had that has focused on this issue. There is a lot of passion. And after you hear everything tonight, if you haven't heard it before, I hope you're passionate too. Um, we have uh, been uh, in contact and uh, regular um, liaison with the negotiating team. Um, and we um, are, uh, once the federal government became involved, the committees worked to develop strong relationships with federal staff Local government committee is updated after every negotiating session, and we've met with the negotiating team and the director general from Global Affairs Canada during the recent transboundary uh, conference. Um, the and we're currently uh, updating our recommendations as things have changed over the last five years, which is why it's a really good idea to be out here with you. Um, so, the treaty process recommendations, local government status, and uh, we feel the protocol with the negotiating team is working, so we can all be happy about that. Um, engagement with base and residents, and we feel that this is really, really important that we're doing this here tonight and that we have the committee has been all around the basin to numerous uh, communities. Um, we need to uh, also continue to assess benefits and impacts and um, we have to be able to provide those uh, that information to basin residents and also sometimes we actually get to speak to our cohorts in the United States um, such as at the Transboundary Committee, and it's important that we can um, articulate uh, what we're interested in there as well. Um, and that's just community members to community members. Um, and so our, um, our draft highlights um, are here, and um, you can... Um, uh, 
the treaty process, local government status. We're very, we're very um, supportive of uh, Indigenous nations having meaningful role in the negotiations. That was a very happy day for us. Um, the committee has ongoing engagement um, and um, we're very confident that the recommendation and voices of Basin residents are being reflected um, in negotiations and we're prepared to act if this changes. So um, one thing about it is not shrinking violets. I've been very happy with the collaborative, respectful, um, but frank dialogue that we're able to have. Uh, I'm a new kid on the block. I've only been here for a year. And so it's been very refresh refreshing. Um, and so I think that making sure all benefits and impacts along the river are assessed and considered in treaty decisions. And it's very difficult. The needs at one end of the Columbia River are not the same as the needs at the other. And so we really have to embrace what our colleagues and fellow citizens of the basin um, feel are important. And so the committee has been great for that. Um, and we also need to try and identify what information is important to you. And um, that is sometimes not an easy task either, but we are happy to do it. Um, and so the, the treaty content recommendations um, are to, of course, reduce uh, the negative impacts to the basin. Uh, we'd like to be able to share in benefits equitably. Um, we uh, really have highlighted, and so has the community and First Nations, um, that we need to include ecosystems and that is shared amongst many people in the United States. So we're not alone there. Um, flood risk management, of course, to local government is very, very important. Um, we're responsible for emergency management. And um, so it's always of interest to us. Um, and we'd like to be able to have more input into Libby because as you learn more about the system tonight, it's very important to the management of um, Kootenai Lake in the spring when the flood risk is high. Um, and uh, power generation, we all benefit from. And um, we, um, sorry, um, we would like to uh, continue the rights to BC water use. So um, the committee believes that the, uh, the US reservoirs should be drawn down more to minimize impacts in BC without making conditions worse in the Kukanusa Reservoir. And so um, we are really happy to also see First Nations championing um, salmon restoration and ecosystems, and you'll hear more about that later. So um, the recommendations too, I think the first two are self-explanatory and um, 13 and 14 are new recommendations. Um, obviously less fluctuation in reservoir levels and um, are updated governance. So um, the governance recommendation is based on input from the public last year and we note that Basin Scale River Management Organization uh, recommendation goes beyond the CRT. So um, the ecosystem expertise um, and uh, local uh, government advisory role um, are all important in establishing uh, governance of ongoing public involvement. And um, uh, we've always distinguished between treaty issues that are discussed in the, in the presentation above and um, which involve BC and the US and domestic issues. And we need to uh, we need to work on all of them in BC. Um, Kukanusa Reservoir is created by the Libby Dam in the U.S., and so it's not managed as the other reservoirs authorized by the CRT. 
Um, we don't think this is uh, appropriate and we'll be working to address issues such as ongoing debris removal, recreation access management and agricultural development. And um, water management process for Kootenai River. Um, this is important. Um, the Kootenai, well, Kootenai River and Kootenai Lake are kind of um, uh, distinct from the treaty process. And so uh, water management process for the Kootenai River is important. Uh, Columbia and Duncan water use plan reviews, that those are um, on, on the list. And I think uh, many of you have mentioned the first two, if you've been here before. And um, of course, the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, um, it's been beneficial and it should continue. Um, we're also speaking with uh, staff about how to improve communication and engagement with Basin residents. Um, and um, the um, Columbia and Duncan water use plans were created through public process in the early 2000s and implemented in 2008. So there will be reviews um, and um, Basin residents are uh, included, their views are included in those reviews. So please pay attention for those upcoming. So um, we do invite your feedback. Uh, local government is local. So we're in your communities, we're at the other end of email, um, usually Facebook, phone. Um, so um, you, can, um, you can pick up um, a paper copy uh, of um, the opportunity to provide feedback, or you can get it online by Googling, as mentioned there. Um, and you can also email our exec director or send written comments. Um, and um, we do, um, we will let you know where the paper copies are available <laughs> later in the program. And um, we uh, also invite you to chat with us after the meeting because we're approachable. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's put this down there. Um, so just, just a, a side note too. So the paper copies of the recommendations that Ramona was talking about are at the side table over here. Uh, and just to reiterate, the CRT Local Governments Committee has been working with the province since 2011 to make sure that Basin residents' interests are front and center when the province works with the federal government to negotiate a modernized treaty. So uh, they have been integral in making sure that the needs of the communities are heard, are understood, and are worked into the negotiations themselves. So this recommendations document that she talks about over there is a review of basically what they're recommending that the province continues to focus on. So if you have any input on that, if there's anything you think is missing that should be on there, then that's where you send your feedback to them here. Um, and I should mention too that all of the presentations, including that one, will be up on our website after these meetings have wrapped up. So um, you can visit our website there if you want more information. Uh, so that, that's great. Thank you again, Ramona. Uh, we'll now move on to an update from the negotiators themselves on the Columbia River Treaty negotiations. Uh, so first, I'd like to turn it over to Lynn Panaya, who's joining us from Ottawa right now. Uh, and we'll see her face up here fairly soon. Take it away, Lynn. Thank you very much, Brooke. And uh, good evening, Nelson. My name is Lynn Panaya, and I'm a senior advisor at Global Affairs Canada and part of the Columbia River negotiating team. The Government of Canada is really pleased to continue our involvement in these meetings, and it remains our goal to engage with Basin residents throughout the modernization of the Columbia River Treaty. As you may know, we were in the basin in September for the eighth round of negotiations with the United States. These negotiations were held in a calm near Cranbrook, uh, which provided a good foundation for our discussions with the basin clearly in focus. Right after the negotiations, we attended the Columbia River Transboundary Conference hosted by the Columbia Basin Trust in Kimberley. 
We have to give credit to the conference organizers and participants for making the Kimberly Conference informative and inspirational. Members of the Canadian team gained much insight, including through our interaction with longtime residents, students, and Indigenous, Indigenous Nations representatives. We were also pleased that members of the Canadian team that participated in the negotiations with the US, federal, provincial, and Indigenous representatives were in Kimberley. We were equally impressed to see the members, to see some members of the US delegation there as well. Before I begin an update on the treaty negotiations, I would like to underline three important milestones we have hit in the last year. First, in April 2019, representatives of the Tanaka, Sequapam, and Silks Okanagan nations were invited by the Minister of Foreign Affairs to participate as official observers on the Canadian delegation for the Columbia River Treaty negotiations. These three nations have now been part of the last two round of negotiations this past June and September. Their presence has enriched our discussions and contributed to crafting stronger negotiation positions that reflect a more inclusive perspective, a perspective that was lacking when the treaty was first negotiated in the 1960s. The three nations are part of our pre-negotiation meetings. They participate in our caucus meetings during the negotiations and at the last round, they presented on two topics we know are critical to the basin, salmon reintroduction and ecosystems. The second important milestone for the year took place in late July when our five governments, Canada, BC, the Tanaka, Sequapam, Silks Okanagan, signed a three-year commitment to study the feasibility of reintroducing salmon into the upper Columbia River Basin. It was a historic moment for all of us, made in the spirit of genuine partnership and reconciliation. And finally, we offer our congratulations to the government of British Columbia for their landmark legislation to implement the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is a hugely significant step forward and one that will help us as the government shape our approach to the Columbia River modernization process. Now on to the update on the last round of negotiations. As I said, Canada hosted the eighth round of negotiations in a calm near Cranbrook from September 10th to the 11th. It was a deliberate and easy decision to hold our negotiations in a calm because we wanted to ensure that as much as possible, we are in the Columbia River Basin, the region that bears the direct impact on the Columbia River Treaty. Our discussions in the calm were fruitful. There is a positive spirit of collaboration as both countries continue to exchange information and technical details to work towards a realistic understanding of each other's interests and concerns as we progress to formal negotiations. Specifically, on ecosystems, we are gaining a better understanding of both of our countries' approaches to this issue. Canada's Indigenous Nations representatives, as I mentioned, delivered an ecosystems presentation along with the government of British Columbia to demonstrate the work that has been done collaboratively on this issue. Notably, the US also recognizes the importance Canada has placed on this issue, and we believe that we have laid the groundwork for further thinking and deeper collaboration in the context of a modernized treaty. The entire Canadian delegation was also really pleased to have, the U to have U.S. tribal representatives from the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho, the Confederated Tribes of Colville, and the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation participate in the negotiations. They spoke about ecosystem work primarily centered around flows for fish that the U.S. has undertaken in the basin, including through their transboundary efforts. On salmon, the Canadian Indigenous Nation representatives highlighted the recently signed letter of agreement and the upcoming approach to studying the feasibility of reintroducing salmon to the Upper Columbia. I'll defer to the Indigenous representatives at your meeting to provide more detail on these issues. 
Finally, we also continued discussions on flood risk management and hydropower, and we are pleased to see progress on both of these issues. Frankly speaking, this has been a complex undertaking as both sides grapple with their own unique data. We hope we can hit some common ground here in the coming weeks and months ahead. I'll close my round eight update by saying that though this is a multifaceted negotiation and one that isn't straightforward, I can say with certainty that there is a very strong spirit of collaboration and goodwill among the Canadian and US delegations. This is very clear. So it is our hope that we will come to an agreement that is both fair and also encompasses the issues that were missed in 1964 when the treaty was first agreed upon. We are in the process of preparing for the next round of negotiations. As you can see with what I've outlined above and the ongoing work by both sides on flood risk management, power and ecosystems, we are looking at confirming round nine negotiations hosted in the US for some time in January or February 2020. In this upcoming round and future rounds, we will continue to make clear that basin interests including ecosystems are promoted. We seek a modernized treaty that provides benefits on both sides of the border. And for Canada, that means benefits that are felt in the province and in the basin. Thank you very much for allowing me these few minutes to update you on the work of the Columbia River Treaty negotiations and for your attention. It's very important to us to understand your views as we continue our negotiations with the United States. Thank you to Kathy and Brooke and company for organizing these meetings. Thank you to Ray, as always, for taking care of our AV needs and beaming us in from Ottawa so effectively. I wish you well in your deliberations tonight. We look forward to updating you again soon. And finally, I'd be pleased to stay on for the Q&A session as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. That's great, yeah. Um, we'll hear now from Kathy Eichenberger, who some of you may recognize. She's the BC lead on the treaty negotiating team. Go ahead, you have to turn it on. You have to turn it on. There you go. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Lynn, for kicking off the negotiation update. I, I seem to hear more and more of my speaking points creep into my federal counterparts uh, every evening, but that's okay. That's okay. And it just shows how close we are on the same page. And, um, but I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight. You can imagine that um, leading uh, the BC uh, thought process on negotiations and being part of a Canadian delegation takes a lot of time and I'm not able to be at all of the 12 meetings, but it was important for me to be here in, in Nelson, um, especially since uh, I worked here for 10 years and this place is very near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the points that I want to raise is that a lot of people wonder, well, why is BC part of a uh, Canada-US negotiation? Um, yes, uh, traditionally or, or, and constitutionally, the responsibility for negotiating international treaties it falls on uh, the Canadian government. But um, in 1963, Canada uh, transferred or delegated the uh, responsibilities of implementing a treaty and the benefits of the treaty to British Columbia under a 1963 Canada-BC agreement. And that had never been done before, and it has never been done since. So it shows a very special, a unique kind of relationship that we have with Canada on this. But the collaboration uh, between us, between the province and, and uh, Global Affairs Canada, goes way beyond the requirements of that agreement. And you know, we, we've been very fortunate since 2011 to have them work side by side with us. Um, and through the Columbia uh, River Treaty Review, when we were deciding and consulting on whether the treaty should continue or be amended or terminated, um, and they, that collaboration continues all the way through this negotiation phase. So we're, we're very pleased. You know, you often hear about Fed prob relationships and they're not always uh, smooth, but uh, we are all part of one team and, and now with Indigenous Nations and it's just wonderful. Um, I, I also have to mention that we're very fortunate to have Minister Katrina Conroy as a minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty. She's been very, very engaged in the file. and very accessible to our team and our office as well. And that's fairly rare in government. 
uh, and she knows firsthand about the impacts of the treaty. Uh, her, her husband, Ed's farm, was inundated um, by at Arrow Lakes Reservoir, and she speaks to, as often as she can, she, she basically never turns down the opportunity to speak to either the media um, or uh, the AKBLG or the Transboundary Forum to keep people informed, but also to raise the, the importance of of the Columbia River Treaty and, and one of her passions is involving youth and I am so glad I see a lot of young faces today and make sure we'll report that back to her. We we'll, should come over and take pictures before everybody leaves um, because you know we, we need to find new ways of engaging youth and we've been talking about it even this morning and and if if some of them don't come to us, then we will go to them. So we're, we're really energized about that. The other thing that the minister does um, is go to the United States and talks about our issues and impacts and the benefits of the treaty in the US. And she's a very strong advocate. And uh, next Sunday, she's actually a keynote speaker at the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. It's a big uh, conference in Seattle. Uh, and I'm sure she's going to be influencing a lot of the US thinking process there. Um, I, I won't say much more about the local government committee except to say how important they are since the beginning to guide, to guide us, the province, on how to engage uh, all of the citizens and uh, also uh, providing feedback and input in, in how we develop uh, our, our guiding principles around the negotiations. When they came out with their recommendations uh, and the, uh, the province of BC came out with its decision in 2014 on uh, to continue the treaty and seek improvements and there were 14 guiding principles that reflected what we heard and we compared the two documents and there was a lot of alignment. So we were very fortunate and, and I know that they make sure that all of the issues are considered and, and actually have an impact. In fact, uh, uh, Deb and, and, and Karen Hamling, they went to Ottawa twice. Deb and Karen go to Ottawa and talk to senior officials and let them know face to face from a number of departments what are the issues in the basin. Um, so, you know, in the 60s, uh, I know a lot of you weren't born, but take my word for it. <laughs> uh, nobody listened to the folks here. Nobody, the indigenous nations were ignored. Uh, your, your views didn't count. And now today it's different and, and it's important it's different. Uh, there's CBRAC, local government committee, we have media, Twitter, all these rounds of, of community consultations and, and government and, and others are listening now. And, and people are listening to each other. We don't, we don't have this polarization on our side of the border about issues around the treaty. So it's, it's so refreshing. And we have, you know, the Upper Columbia uh, Basin Environmental Collaborative who are working together and are also contributing. And it's special, but why am I not surprised? Because it is the Kootenays. Um, so um, the, the Indigenous Nations contribution, I, I can't say enough about that. And you've heard about it and you'll hear some more about it. Um, we would be so much the poorer if they uh, they weren't contributing and as real partners they're so enriching all our, our thinking and and getting us to understand values beyond our normal uh way of thinking and opening up you know new thought processes and ideas and lenses so uh it's been a wonderful experience so uh, I'm happy that you're here. We want to tell you how we've, we've made pro pro progress on things that you've told us over the years. And we also want to hear from you if whether we're on the right track, as, as Brooke said. Um, and with regards to these community meetings, uh, uh, it's all Brooke. I, sh I shouldn't be thanked. Brooke and Anna and Ingrid and, and, uh, and I'd love, I'm so happy to see so many people because I bet that we'd have a good crowd and you made me win my bet. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> we, we may or may not guess numbers before each meeting and, and you guys blew all our numbers out of the water. So thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Kathy. So now I'd like to welcome uh, back up to the stage, uh, Natalie Allard, as well as Nathan Matthew to speak a bit about the indigenous perspective on the treaty negotiations. I'll go with this. 
Okay. No zooming in too much. I can't stop eating those cookies and I haven't checked my teeth yet. So. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you, hello again. Um, as was previously mentioned, uh, my name is Natalie Allard. So I was officially appointed as the cultural lead for the Columbia River Treaty. And then I also sit on our negotiation advisory team. And then so that's composed of all of the five governments. So uh, there's Canada, BC, and then as well as the Okanagan, Silks, the Shushwap, and then the Tanaha. And then so we have made a major, major headway. Um, one of the highlights and everything from our negotiation advisory team is our negotiation framework agreement. And then so uh, that uh, has been officially signed off by all five governments. And that lays out how we're actually going to work together uh, through this process. And then, um, we do have the observer status. And then, so that started in round seven of the negotiations in between uh, Canada and the US. And then, so uh, we officially got pulled in for all of the prep meetings um, for all of the rounds of negotiations starting in round five. And it is really an observer plus because we're involved in all different aspects of the negotiation rounds, all the way from the prep meetings, the caucus meetings, and then having the observer status. And then so our input in negotiations provides that our, well, that longevity and our deep knowledge about the Columbia River and all living things that rely on the river for survival. Ensuring our voice is a strong part of the negotiations allows us to regain our ability to meet our own responsibilities. And so it's very, very meaningful participation. So as was br uh, briefly mentioned earlier, uh, the round eight of negotiations was actually hosted in a column. So that is my community that I am from, where I live. And so uh, I took full advantage of that and I put together a few different presentations to highlight the cultural aspects. And one of the most important things that I actually did to kick off the meeting was I went and brought in the entire Akamnik Elementary School over to open up that meeting. And then I did that because I wanted to highlight our children. Because, you know, as with all of you, this, this is my life. This is not just a job. And I wanted to bring them into this process as well, because uh, we're speaking for all of those who came before us, all of those who are here right now, and all of those who are yet to come. And then so uh, we have a lot of various subcommittees that are working on all different aspects of the Columbia River. So you'll be hearing from Michael about um, and a lot of the salmon work that's being done, the ecosystem uh, work that's also going on. Uh, we've yet to make major headway in the cultural values, but it is coming. There's lots of different modeling going on. And we also have our First Nations working group. And then so some other highlights is the salmon LOA, um, receiving the observer status and having very effective and efficient and meaningful participation. So as I said earlier, all of our values do align. So feel free to connect, to learn, to participate and to reach out. And then I wanna thank, especially the local governments committee for all of the, uh, support and everything uh, for pushing for First Nations direct involvement. So, Tachas, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. It's certainly. <laughs> Certainly, an honor to uh, to represent uh, the uh, Indigenous uh, perspective. Uh, I'm from uh, the Sahuab Nation, the Shushwaps, and uh, uh, you might say, "Well, why are you here? Uh, what what do the Sahuab have to do with the Columbia River Treaty?" 
uh, we have a traditional territory in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, I come from a, a division within the nation uh, called the Simch. And our territory runs just north of Kamloops, all the way to Jasper, McBride, and down the uh, Kenbasket, used to be the Canoe River, to the uh, uh, Big Bend area, to the Relostoke. And uh, I, I work along with the other Sequabmuk, the, the Shushua Band at Invermeer. Uh, they have a, a lot of interest, of course, in, in the basin. And we have uh, another division, the Lakes Division, the Shushua uh, Lakes. Uh, that uh, part of our nation, the people came over regularly and had a lot of relationships in terms of hunting, fishing, and uh, occupying the, the basin area. So. That's who, who I am. And uh, the, uh, the other observers, uh, and that is a, that is a pretty, pretty cool position uh, to, to be able to actually sit in the room with the Canada US delegations uh, in the negotiations and, and observe what's going on. You hear all the words and it has been mentioned. We participate in all aspects of planning and, uh, before and, and during the in caucus sessions, and uh, um, our voice uh, has been heard. So you might say, and still, why are you involved? Besides, <laughs> besides, besides you're just sort of interested. Well, really, the uh, much like uh, residents like yourself, when the uh, Columbia River Treaty was negotiated, 50, 60 years ago, you really weren't consulted. Your interests really weren't uh, a, a big priority. And uh, you remember that. And I think that's why a lot of you are here. You want to adjust something about the operations of that system to more fully accommodate some of your interests. So it's the same with us. We were not recognized, as, as, as mentioned, and, uh, but since then, through change in the Constitution, our, our Aboriginal rights have been recognized. Uh, 1982, uh, the, uh, through a series of Supreme Court decisions, it was recognized and confirmed that none of our uh, inherent rights to our lands, to our rights to self-determination, to benefit from our from the resources within uh, and have a voice in how the resources were used, and to have a government of our own to represent our interests. Those have all been confirmed. And uh, most recently, uh, taking, uh, standing up shoulder to shoulder with, with other nations in the world, Canada has determined that it's best to recognize that Indigenous people worldwide have rights. And they signed on to the rights of the Indigenous people uh, through that declaration. So Canada has an official policy, BC has an official policy, and they say, we want to recognize your right to self-determination, self-governance, right to your lands, territories, right to decision-making and, and right to benefit. So that's a big mouthful. That's why I'm here. That's why the indigenous people are here. And of course, uh, a lot of time has gone past. A lot of relationships have been built uh, under the different regimes over time. And uh, now it's time we believe, and I hopefully, it, it's responded to in a positive way to uh, reconcile that history, reconcile those rights, bring ourselves up into today's world and look forward to a better place by working together on issues like this. There are many, many issues to deal with. So, yeah. Um, so I've had the advantage of looking at uh, some of the information from you, the Valley uh, Basin residents, uh, from 2012 when there was a more for formal engagement. And uh, 
beyond. I mean, throughout the generations and decades, there have been concerns by uh, Basin residents about what the heck is going on. You know, the reservoirs go up and down and the water is, is warmer. It's uh, the, the quality of water has de declined. And what can we do about it? And uh, apparently there's a possibility through this uh, renewal, this renegotiation of the Columbia River Treaty. And so, uh, as was mentioned, we have a, a lot in common about simply wanting a better environment, cleaner water, and uh, uh, establishing a vision for a, a better place for ourselves and the generations to come through adjustments that we trust will be made in the operation of, of the uh, Columbia uh, Basin uh, through the Columbia River Treaty Agreement. And just to, to end, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased, as was mentioned, that we, we're taking leadership in the era of the, well, it's, it's a funny word to me, ecosystem functioning <laughs> within the basin, but just as looking after the environment, how we can make things uh, better. So we're taking on a, a series of a dozen or more research projects around the environment, ecosystem functions. That's for the Canada BC position. So it's not just for us, that's the, for, for everyone. So we'll be doing the, the research and uh, Michael will be talking about that later, but that's something we're taking the lead in and uh, very pleased to be able to do that and make that contribution. And uh, as was mentioned to the, the salmon, uh, that's a, it's a real interest to us and I know a real interest to, to res other residents of the, of the basin. And uh, that's a true challenge, but uh, an exciting one. So the last thing is just uh, how do we determine and express our cultural values, our cultural interests within the basin? What are they? What are you indigenous people? What do you think is important for yourself? Well, we're working on that and we're doing some research and that's just started. We just last week, we talking about frameworks and research and all that sort of stuff. So we're just uh, ready to go with that. And uh, hopefully within a, a number of months, we'll be able to come up with some draft ideas that we'll be able to put on, on the table and say, this is what we are interested in. And this is why we want and how we want to adjust the, the operations of that system to accommodate some of our interests and our values. So I am so pleased to be here uh, representing the uh, Sequim people and working alongside the other uh, indigenous uh, representatives, uh, the federal provincial government, BC Hydro, and uh, people like you, Cook Stamp. Thanks so much, Nathan, and to Natalie. Uh, so now we can take questions, questions and comments. Uh, and as we do, um, you'll need to speak into the mic so that it feeds into the speakers and all the rest of it. So bear with me as I run around with the microphone, but I'll ask now, does anybody have any questions or, or comments for any of the speakers about treaty negotiations or related to the treaty otherwise? Thank you, Brooke. I have two questions. Negotiations started some time ago. And uh, at the beginning of the process, negotiations, had, and I think what I'm hearing is negotiations have been quite cordial to this point. There are some critical issues around water worldwide, and we know that the, what is happening in the future around the Columbia Basin is going to be critical. I'd like to know if the negotiations are heating up and if those, um, if those uh, issues are being brought to, to the fore and how that's proceeding. And particularly in, in connection to uh, the date of 2024, when we move to on-call flood control, I know that that's a triggering point for the United States. And uh, as we move closer to that date, I'm wondering how those negotiations are going, what the tone is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lynn or Kathy, would either of you like to take that? Go, oh, do we hear you, Lynn? We might have lost her. Sorry about that. I, I had myself on mute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, 
So I would start off by saying that um, the negotiations have not been heated yet. Um, we're really at a point where we've been exchanging um, information, exchanging data, and really trying to understand each other's views and concerns and um, uh, getting a sense of what each other wants in a modernized treaty. So um, it's been very cordial, as I, as I noted in my remarks, um, but it is going to be tough and it is going to get tough. Um, but we're not at that point where, um, in, uh, where it has been heated yet. Um, I think having these rounds where we've had this opportunity to really get comfortable with one another, uh, understand each other is, is a good foundation. Um, but I don't think that um, it's, it's uh, beyond the understanding of anyone on the delegation, most especially uh, the chief negotiator, Sylvain Fabi, that um, things will get more difficult as we proceed forward. Thank you, Lynn. I think Kathy is moving from her chair, so I feel like she's going to say a few words. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just want to add that it's really been interest-based discussions and not win-lose and not confrontational. And you see that a lot in, in, you know, people ask us, is it like NAFTA or is it, you know, like uh, other uh, difficult uh, negotiations with, with the U.S.? But I think what's reflected is the collaboration that we've had for 55 years with the US and both sides want that to continue. Um, with regards to 2024, you know, Deb asked, um, it, it's still five years away and um, we're trying to find what is a path that would serve the interests of both countries in that. Um, and, there is, and there is still time. Uh, we have, we are, we, we wish we could tell you a lot more of what is said in the negotiating room and what our positions are, but as you can understand, that would be very difficult. We need to be able to keep a lot of that, uh, the Canadian positions confidential. Um, and, and I know people are frustrated with that. I know that some people in other meetings said, well, we've, gave, <laughs> we've given an update, but we still don't know what they're talking about <laughs> in the negotiating room. Um, but we will continue to come back to you and, and let you know uh, how it's progressing. And also at one point when there are going to be choices and when we're getting close to some options into a, a modernized treaty, we will come back to you and we'll present these options and we'll get feedback from you. Hang on. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No question is off the table. There we go. <laughs> Um, it's nice that we speak of things being cordial and we're reconciling left and right. Could someone reconcile for me how we have an announcement about UNDRIP and the position BC has taken on it, which is encouraging. Well, the very same day BC announces that it's challenging the, the uh, presence of the Sinaixed people here at I. I do not understand what it, I haven't heard the word Sinaixed at all tonight. Um, I, I, I think the entire history is embarrassing on BC's part for having a, effectively a, uh, been responsible for the expulsion of the Sinaixed by policy. And we're just seeming to me to be going along with them having been disappeared and we're going to the Supreme Court to make sure they stay disappeared. So is there anybody that can explain why the Sinaixed do not have an authentic voice in what's going on here? Okay, I, thanks. I appreciate the question because it helps clarify what our position, the Clear Tree uh, BC team's position is regarding the Sinaixed. So we absolutely do respect the decisions of the BC courts. Uh, and, and that we acknowledge that they have rights, that the Lakes Division of the Confederate Tribes of the Colville Reservation have rights in this region. 
There is no question. It's been confirmed by the courts and, and, it's, and we acknowledge that. With regards to the Columbia River Treaty, uh, I had the opportunity uh, earlier this year to have a bit of a discussion with Chairman Colston. He's a chairman of the Confederate uh, Colville tribes around the CRT issue. And I, I suggested to him that uh, while the Confederate Colville tribes are being consulted by the US State Department, that had they, would they be engaged with Canada in developing Canadian negotiating positions might seem like a conflict of interest or at least a perceived conflict of interest. And so we, we kind of left it at that, a bit of the door open, um, have not heard from Chairman Coston or Confederate Colville tribes that, that they wanted to engage with Canada. Because you can understand, you know, working with, with both, both countries at the same time. Um, that being said, you know, the, the Aboriginal rights uh, and all that includes are shared amongst Indigenous nations. And, uh, and that's what we continue to work towards. With regards to the decision on, on appealing to the Supreme Court of Canada, that's a decision that was made by the Attorney General. And I really am not involved and can't really speak to the rationale behind or I have no information on that. But I, I appreciate your question, so thank you. Go ahead, Kathy, you want to pass I was just wondering, um, I'm gathering that you said that the, we had three choices, Canada, to, um, to continue the, the treaty, scrap the treaty, or to seek improvements. So I'm gathering that the United States is in the same position. They've decided to continue the treaty and seek improvements. Are we all on the same page that way? And I'm also, and I guess you probably can't tell, but... Um, what do you anticipate some of the biggest sticking points are going to be in the negotiation? Um, well, uh, I, so first of all, uh, we have the BC decision is on our website and I think there's copies there, there are copies there, um, that uh, outlines in the principles what's important to us and the context. The United States also followed a similar, well, a different process, but they came out with recommendations to their State Department. Uh, and, uh, and it's a fairly lengthy, lengthier statement uh, where there are a lot of things that are aligned, but there are things that are different. Um, and I think the best is to compare the two, but um, I, I think, uh, and we've said this publicly, so I can emphasize it, that, uh, and it was mentioned before, is that we would like to have more input uh, uh, in the management of Libby Dam. Uh, we uh, feel that uh, there are benefits to the US beyond flood control and, and electricity uh, generation on, on fisheries, on recreation, on navigation, that are benefits and that they should be shared equitably. Um, the, how we view and understand ecosystems for all the right reasons is very different on both sides of the border, just because of the, the land formation and, and, and the environmental, the, the ecosystems on both sides. So they're focused more on fish and we're more focused on what you'll hear about tonight. Um, but I think we, up till now we've appreciated each other's interests and and I wouldn't say that there'll be sticking points it's it's getting into the zone of agreement and we're we're, we're working towards getting into the zone I hope that's, um, I want to see that wording in like <laughs> BC and Canada and, and the US are getting into the zone <laughs> uh, question in the back here Hi, thank you. So uh, a sticking point that I've noticed at, at other conferences has been the Canadian entitlement. Where are we on the Canadian entitlement? If you could bring us up to speed on that, thank you. And maybe first just explain briefly what it is. Thank you. I just wanted to add to that. Maybe yeah. you can help me answer both questions sure. at the same time. Yes. Oh, okay. That is, hang on, sorry. <laughs> It seems when some of these negotiations were 
being contemplated as having started, there were noises within people in the United States, in the, in the federal government, not to do with the negotiating committee, that, that said that they felt that the downstream benefits that Canada was getting were much too rich and that uh, the Canadian entitlement was too rich and it really needed to be cut back. And I, you know, is this is this a position that they intend to take in in the uh, upcoming or further deliberations? So I don't know if Lynn, I could start, Lynn, and you could jump in. Uh, so noise is not a factor in the negotiations. We ignore the noise. If we didn't ignore the noise, we would be very far apart, and we'd be very far behind. So. Um, what counts to us is what we hear from the officials who are responsible for negotiating a treaty. The Canadian entitlement is our share of the increased, I'll call it electricity that's produced in the United States as a result of how we manage flows of the border. And by us doing that in certain ways, uh, they're able to produce more electricity than what they had before. They could produced before and we get half of the share. And we, we find that that's a fair arrangement. Um, Lynn, did you want to add to that? I think what I'd say, I'm not gonna speak specifically to the entitlement. Um, I think we just haven't, haven't um, gotten to that point into the negotiations where we, where we are talking about the entitlement. Um, but I will say that um, even if there are strong views on the Canadian side that the entitlement was too high for Canada the first time around, um, I can assure you that with the Canadian negotiating team, and I mean the whole team, the federal government, the BC government, um, BC Hydro, the Indigenous Nations, I, I believe there's agreement that uh, we are not going to accept a deal that doesn't have value to Canada. And by value, I mean not only monetary, but also taking into consideration all of the needs and the concerns that we've heard from Indigenous nations and we've heard from Basin residents around um, ecosystem uh, flexibility within a modernized treaty, um, salmon reintroduction, uh, attention being given to climate impacts, et cetera. So, um, I think our view is that this isn't simply about the monetary value of the entitlement, but everything around what is going to be of best value to Canada in a modernized treaty. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, one more follow-up. And then I think we have time for maybe two more questions after this. Uh, the answer to my last question was that to the, the, the lady up there thought that uh, what I had expressed was just noise. And that really what we had to do was pay attention to what the uh, negotiating people were saying, not to the larger uh, political community in the United States. However, in your own publication here, it says under US Constitution, only the president can make decisions international treaties based on advice and consent of the Senate. Yes. That, that concerns me. Yeah, and uh, I would say that concerns me too. And part of the reason for that is that we have not decided, uh, one of the legal questions around the negotiations is what a modernized treaty is going to look like. Does that mean that we're going to reopen the treaty of 1964? Does it mean we're going to add uh, an annex or a protocol to the Treaty of 1964. These are questions that we're trying to work around because we, we do understand that um, should we reopen the treaty, it needs to be ratified by the U.S. Senate and then approved by the President. And there could be challenges around that depending on when um, the treaty is, is, the negotiations are completed depending on when um, and what occurs in the U.S. election in 2020. There, there are many, many questions around this. Um, we don't have a specific timeline yet for the end of the treaty negotiation. Uh, I take your point 
Uh, again, these are questions on the legal side that I know our lawyers are looking into, and I'm certain um, uh, other lawyers on the Canadian delegation are thinking about as well. But we don't have a we don't have a clear answer to this question at all. Yeah, and it's one that will have to be negotiated with the U.S. And and I I just want to clarify. I wasn't saying that your comments were noise, but in the U.S the views are a lot more polarized. And we are very fortunate that the views that we've been hearing throughout the communities are very much aligned with some differences. But I'll tell you why I'm not worried. I'm not worried because this treaty has tremendous value to the United States. And they are, there are people in, in the US who are worried because they don't want to see that value lost. They, they don't want to see a predictable navigation level and flows. They don't want to, they don't want to see the disappearance of uh, enhanced flows for, for salmon fisheries. They don't want to see um, uh, losing 55 years of flood protection. And uh, so from a value perspective, that's why we think we will reach an agreement because it's as valuable to them, if not more, than it is to us currently. Thank you to both of you and then Kathy. Um, I know I said two, but maybe one more question. Any, any other questions or comments? One more here, yep, go ahead. Sorry, I got here a bit late, but just a question. Is the ecosystem function going to be considered as part of the treaty? Because I understand the previous government said fish and fish passage wasn't part of the original treaty. And the understanding was uh, that it wouldn't be as they presented to the, the their their position when the, when it came out a few years ago, they wouldn't consider ecosystem function and fish passage as part of treaty negotiations, but it would be separate from treaty. And I just wondered if maybe you guys already touched on that or can touch on that more. I'll let Lynn uh, answer that first. Yeah. I think I, I may defer to you, Kathy, on the fish, on the fish passage side, but on the Canadian side, um, including uh, ecosystem flexibility is a core position as we go into these negotiations. And I'll keep it at that. In fact, uh, Sylvain Fabi, the lead negotiator uh, last night, uh, reiterated what Minister Conroy said last night is that there will be no agreement unless ecosystems is considered within the treaty, a modernized treaty. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know some of you might have questions that you weren't able to ask, or maybe you're still kind of forming what it is that you, you want to ask, but I encourage you to write your questions and comments on the participant evaluation forms. We also have cards at the back table here with an email address that comes directly to myself and to Kathy, um, and therefore can be, any questions can be distributed to any of the presenters here tonight. Uh, and um, we're also on social media as well. So, please reach out to us with your questions and comments after the fact. Of course, we'll hang out here after this meeting is done too. Uh, we really do uh, need and value your input on this. So uh, thank you for your questions so far. These were really great. And we look forward to chatting with you more about this. Um, so thank you very much to Kathy. And, and Lynn, maybe we'll give you a moment to say a few words before we release you to the rest of your evening. <laughs> yeah, it's close to bedtime here. Um, thank you very much for giving uh, the Government of Canada an opportunity to participate in your community meetings. Um, we really are listening to your concerns. Um, they're not falling on deaf ears. We have an incredibly robust delegation with um, the province of BC, with uh, BC Hydro and with the Indigenous Nations and um, I truly believe the Basin's concerns are being well represented in these negotiations. So. Um, please don't hold back on um, providing us with your ideas um, because we will be looking at them and uh, taking them into consideration as we go forward in these negotiations. So thank you very much again and have a good evening. Thank you so much, Lynn. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with that, I think we'll move into the next portion of the evening where I will turn the stage over to Michael Zimmer, who is a biologist with the Okanagan Silks Nation. 
and he's going to share with you an update on uh, the work that's being done and led by Indigenous Nations uh, in collaboration with many other parties that he'll talk about uh, on re looking at the feasibility of reintroducing salmon as well as more on the ecosystem work that we've heard about. So with that, do you, I'll give you the clicker, I'll give you in a sec. <laughs> Great, thank you everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to come and speak and, and, uh, and listen as well. Um, let me see if I can, you're on deck to start that? So it's my pleasure to, to come before you and talk about uh, two, two of the elements uh, within a modernized treaty and that's uh, the letter of agreement or under um, salmon reintroduction to the Columbia and as well as in a little bit here talking about the ecosystem uh, function elements and the work that we've been working through. So just waiting for the slide deck to come up. Um, the, uh, the three First Nations on the Columbia, the the, Shepna, the Tanaha, the Silk, as well as uh, the province of BC and uh, uh, Canada, uh, affectionately known as the Gang of Five, uh, ratified this agreement um, um, earlier this year in summer. Uh, but I just want to give you the backstory here. Where am I pointing? There, oops. So the salmon story is one of tremendous loss in the Columbia system. So this is just a, a, a graphic and a summary. This, on this map here, this shows the historical range of salmon throughout uh, the blocked, uh, now blocked portion of the Columbia River. Uh, all the way up through Arrow Lakes, up around Big Bend, Kimbasket, and uh, some of the salmon, the large June hogs, these 60, 70 pound Chinook salmon would spawn at the outlet of uh, Windermere Lake in Invermere. Um, and also the use, uh, indigenous use fishing camps, noted by those little fishies uh, on the map there, uh, all of that lost. But in terms of numbers, uh, you know, the magnitude is uh, in the order of uh, two to almost four million salmon and steelhead. Steelhead are the, the ocean going form of rainbow trout, migratory rainbow trout. Thousands of miles of streams, main stem and tributary habitats, four major nursery lakes. These are the Arrow Lakes, Kimbasket, uh, Slocan Lake, for those that don't know where it was historically part of the salmon range. Um, the Upper Columbia tribes, uh, in terms of their consumption numbers, Six, uh, six to 13 million pounds of salmon annually. And uh, the Canadian portion, uh, 125 to 750,000 salmon and steelhead. And the lower river tribes, the annual harvest uh, in the order of one to almost three million salmon and steelhead destined to spawn above Chief Joseph Dam. And geographically speaking, Chief Joseph Dam is the 10th dam uh, up from the ocean. The salmon can divert, traverse nine of those dams at this point and are now blocked at, uh, at Chief Joe. In terms of a timeline, this is some of the recent history uh, going back the last four years, but I really want to preface this story with, with the, the, the story of loss that goes back since the 1940s with, uh, with the construction of Grand Coulee. So during that time, uh, you know, the Indigenous nations, all salmon peoples along the Columbia uh, didn't have access to salmon, but year after year, those tribes would gather and have ceremony to call back the salmon, even though they knew it was blocked. So the, the backstory to this is, is an ongoing one of the, the desire, uh, the right to have salmon up through the entirety of the Columbia. But uh, in terms of this letter of agreement, the history goes back to about 2014, where Indigenous nations started to bend the ear of the federal government saying, we want the salmon back. Um, Moving on, we started to, to talk internally uh, and also been the ear of the Federal Fisheries Ministry, which is uh, the one that, uh, that manages uh, anadromous salmon, uh, the DFO. Uh, in 2017, the Columbia Basin Trust got actively involved to try and provide a cohesive process, bringing together indigenous nations, the province, the federal government, as well as uh, the hydro system operators, those folks that own the dams and operate it. So we all needed to get into a room and start talking about this in earnest. Um, and uh, in 2017, 2018, we had workshop sessions where we could brand, brainstorm and put together a whole list of questions uh, that, were, uh, that are posed and um, uh, require some, some significant thought and investigation in terms of how to make this possible. Uh, in October to July in the last year or so, that gang of five started to draft this letter of agreement and 
just this past July in a sunny day in Castlegar at Millennium Park. Uh, all the five levels of government, uh, some of the folks from the local governments, uh, all gathered at uh, Millennium Park to, to sign that letter of agreement. So what's, what's involved uh, in terms of commitments and, and outcomes? Uh, it, it represents a three-year commitment to start looking at those questions um, with funding provided by the Columbia Basin Trust, provided by the province, and provided by uh, the federal government, which is quite remarkable considering two or three years ago when we started to talk about these things, nobody had a position in terms of the, the province or, or uh, DFO. Uh, under the letter of agreement, the parties will develop a five-year work plan. What is it that we want to achieve? How are we going to get there? So essentially a roadmap. Um, the first part of that is uh, the government structure. Uh, we've got uh, an implementation team. We've got a secretariat. We've got the technical working groups, the indigenous uh, uh, working groups to try and put together a process to, to make it work. Um, and also how to, how to reach out to you folks, how to communicate what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we're achieving. Um, the relationship between us and the states, this is a transboundary issue, so we need to work collaboratively uh, across that border. And um, we're looking at options to, to make it happen in terms of feasibility. And the big thing is the risks. We've got a system that hasn't had salmon for 80 years. Uh, we've got a system that's got a series of taps and what I call bathtubs and brick walls not what we would call a uh, you know, typical salmon habitat. So it's significantly changed and we got to understand if we bring salmon back, is there going to be risks to resident fish or those resident fish can have risks to the salmon? And ultimately, what are the benefits? That's the main driver. We've got to, as you can imagine, what we've heard uh, through those sessions in the community, people want the salmon back because of a litany of benefits. And um, just want to leave you with a couple of postcards on this topic. So how are we going to do it? Those are a lot of questions. This, uh, this top uh, picture here is uh, the salmon cannon, the whoosh system. It's, uh, it's a low pressure, negative pressure that actually sucks fish like a, like a vacuum through this vinyl tube over large distances and over some significant heights. So it looks like an innovative and interesting technology to get adults up. And then in the lower part here, this is uh, what they call a gulper or collector. And you would see those on the, in the head ponds above a, a major high head dam. And essentially they have uh, a nets or attraction flows that bring the smolts into a collector. The out migrating uh, salmon are collected. You can sort them per species or you can sort them in lots and then transport them via a, a truck or through a sluiceway or, or other mechanisms. So the message here is that there's technical uh, technology out there to work on the fish passage issue, particularly around these high head dams, and we're, we're tremendously optimistic on uh, trying to implement some of that here. So that's it on the salmon reintroduction LOA. I'm going to hand it back to Brooke. Or... Oh, we're going to jump right into ecosystem function here. So let me try and do it this way here. So if you have questions on this, uh, you, can, you can jot down uh, on your sticky notes and, uh, and things like that. So um, I'll also say we can take questions about salmon as well once Michael's done with the ecosystem piece. Uh, and then we'll take the questions and comments at that time. So we've heard throughout in terms of the, some of the elements of the, the modernized treaty about including ecosystem function. Uh, some of the language we used in the past was ecosystem based function. So this is all things the environment. So one thing I'd like to mention is that this, this presentation, uh, uh, an expanded version of this presentation was, was presented to the, uh, the Canada-US uh, negotiating team in, in September of this year. So what I want to do is just give some background, uh, talk about the draft ecosystem function goals. And when we talk about ecosystem, we're talking about the, the elements that make up the environment, the soil, uh, the rocks, the water, um, the plants, the animals, and, and the interaction of, of all of those together. So that essentially what an ecosystem is. Uh, the importance of flexibility in the CRT to implement ecosystem function. Uh, and then we'll open up for some brief Q&A and, and hopefully at the end we'll have time for a robust discussion on that. So at this time, I would like to invite Sik uh, Wapnik and uh, Tanaha um, members to come up and just give a perspective on indigenous uh, perspective on ecosystem function. Uh, thank you. 
just the, nothing to do with this. But I was, <laughs> I was talking, talking this evening about Salmo. It hadn't occurred to me that was originally, it was Sam Mun. And that I, I assume that when the salmon come up that river shed, they'll put the end back on the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Learn something every day. So uh, this is just a, an example of, of a whole lot of uh, interests and uh, values that the indigenous people, specifically the Sehwem, have. And just respecting Sehwem Ulu. The, uh, traditionally, we absolutely depended on the land and the resources around us. And it was the rule, it was the law, that we had to take care of that land. The water, the animals, the plants, or else they wouldn't take care of us. And I think that's a, that's a very applicable kind of uh, idea, a big one, when we talk about the uh, renewal of this agreement and how we can put that in there. How can we respect the land? Sahwab Ulu is our Sahwab traditional territory. The other one was Nakuta Satatkwa, one river. And uh, again, we see the, the Columbia Basin, you know, the lakes and the waterways as being one system, that it's one river. And that the, the, the system of connections of all of the natural pieces are, are real. And that it's part of our job and our responsibilities to make those connections function a whole lot better. So uh, again, Naku Tesatkwa is just something that we, we have in our minds. And the other uh, First Nations have similar ideas, very much so. So just a couple of ideas about the way we approach the idea of what are our interests and what should we be working toward uh, with regard to this uh, renewal process. Another five feet of adjusting. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. So the Tanaka, we were put here by the creator. So our oral history speak to the creation of human beings. Uh, these stories have been handed down from generation to generation. So just on that note, um, we it all starts with our culture and our rights practice, which directly feeds into all of our stewardship and decision-making, and then into the healthy ecosystems and water. So Tanaka, as with many other First Nations, have maintained our cultures and our spiritual understandings that stress uh, tradition, community, and harmony with the natural environment. So Tanaka law is Aknun Mustilech. So it's our word for the law that was given to us by the creator. And it speaks to why we were put on this land. And the creator put us here for a purpose. And that purpose is to take care of the land and all of its resources. The law of the land is a law of survival. The land gives us the resources to survive. And in return, uh, we uphold our covenant with the creator to protect and not overuse the land. It is the foundation of our spirituality, that of being humble in our limited understanding and of being respectful of our role within nature and with all the creatures, as well as being respectful of acknowledging the creator and our ancestors. The foundation of our relationship with the land and its resources is our recognition that we are a part of the land. Our understanding of connectedness requires that we have respect for all things as anything that affects one affects everything else. The Tanakha have roots that tie us to the territory and it is believed that we are of the earth. In other words, what we do to the earth, we literally do to ourselves. Uh, 
The Tanakha phrase that captures this interconnectedness is Yakil Anatilki Na Amak. This phrase translates to our people care for the land, and the land cares for our people. Dachas. Thank you, Natalie and Nathan. Uh, just to give the, the, the silk perspective, uh, very much similar tied to the land uh, of the land and responsibility to take care of the land. Uh, this is uh, the, the silk water declaration. And um, I, I won't read through the, the, it in entirety, but I just want to draw attention to maybe perhaps one of the passage. Uh, Any use of water shall be an act of reverence and a commitment to our responsibilities of all life now and to come as silk people. So very much uh, 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 a description of our responsibility uh, to water and its proper management. So let's get into the, into the nitty gritty in terms of uh, ecosystem function. Um, back in 2011, the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, which is a, a sort of a division of uh, BC Hydro, uh, they initiated a study, uh, a dam footprint impact study, basically to try and quantify what was lost in terms of inundation of, uh, of the riverine system uh, as a result. So uh, when we look at, uh, these are the, the um, uh, treaty dams, Kim Basket, which is the reservoir behind Mica Dam, uh, Arrow Lakes, which is the reservoir system behind Hugh Keenly Side Dam, uh, Kukanusa, uh, similar to Libby Dam, Duncan and Duncan Dam. And you can see the, the, the totals in these different ecosystem elements that were lost and uh, you know to look at the the right hand side here in hectares the total loss of all of these all of these dams in terms of these different habitat or uh, ecosystem elements 108,000 hectares so there's uh, about two and a half acres to a hectare so uh, you know we're talking about 250,000 acres worth of lost habitat but just to zero in on, uh, on an example here uh, arrow for example uh, the amount of lake uh, rivers, streams, shallow ponds, gravel bars, wetlands, floodplains, uh, 51,000 acres, or sorry, hectares. Uh, but that was, that was the point in time impact. And what's, what we realize also is this ongoing impact. So since the, since the dam creations in, in the 60s, late 60s, these are ongoing operational impacts. Nutrients are trapped behind these dams, aren't allowed to flow through, fl uh, uh, freely through the systems, barrow, barren ecosystems. We've had discussions last night and a little bit today about these drawdown zones. That's the difference between the high pool of a reservoir and as low as they're able to draft it. So these are, these are biological deserts to some degree where it's, there's no vegetation that grows. It provides limited fish habitat value and it fluctuates. And, and some of the effects that some residents have talked about are these dust storms that are created in these drawdown zones. Streams are inaccessible to fish for spawning, particularly at low flow periods, particularly like Kokanee, for example. Uh, rapid changes in flows below the dams, these ramping rates, you know, they cause scour and they uh, strand fish from time to time. So in terms of uh, support for including ecosystem function in a, in a revitalized uh, uh, or modernized treaty, uh, the province of BC under uh, review um, indigenous nations were, were pretty vocal about including ecosystem function as part of uh, uh, the new treaty. Input at community meetings uh, supported uh, additional ecosystem function. What we heard through, through those roundtables uh, through uh, uh, 2011 to 2013, I guess some of you have participated in those, was the community said, we want to see uh, ecosystem as a third pillar to a modernized treaty. And similarly, the, the local governments, we're all on the same page as uh, understanding that ecosystem function must be in the new treaty. Uh, and then the province, their decision in 2014 to make that happen. So eco ecosystem values are currently and will continue to be an important consideration in, uh, in a modernized treaty. And the province will explore ecosystem-based improvements, recognizing there are a number of available mechanisms inside and outside the treaty and it's, it's important to understand that flow and discharge and operations are the main elements of the treaty that we can use to sort of help guide some of the goals around ecosystem function. And then there's some other things outside the treaty 
uh, we, we heard a little bit about fish passage. So those are elements that are important, but not necessarily found within this uh, ecosystem uh, function uh, work plan. And we have uh, consensus with the tribes uh, across the border um, that uh, ecosystem function must be part of the treaty. Terms, there's a lot of jargon, a lot of language, a lot of technical uh, uh, babble, I suppose, when we're working as a technical working group to pull together um, uh, the elements of a uh, ecosystem function. So just, uh, just to clear up some of, the, some of the jargon, we need clear goals and objectives, and that's where we want to get to. So an example of this, for example, um, increased area in floodplains and wetlands. Uh, performance measures, those are the units, those are the little bits of, uh, of data that we can, can use, manipulate, and, uh, and model uh, to get to our goals. Uh, an example of this is um, hectares of habitat, for example, or meters of stream, those sorts of things. And then we have uh, the high-powered math, the scenario modeling, or the commu compu uh, computer simulations that we need to um, put, put these performance measures, the in these inputs, these data, and then uh, model different scenarios. One of the ones that we've been sort of talking about over the last few years is this stable aero reservoir scenario. And that's where we keep aero reservoir at a, at a certain, certain level and then model out all these different ecosystem functions in response to that. Uh, another one, of course, is also maximizing the system for, for hydro production as it's, uh, you know, it's certainly being operated uh, towards that right now. So we got to consider a bunch of different uh, scenarios and uh, have these computer simulations guide us in terms of what would be the best benefit for ecosystems. Um, so for the last year, we've been um, working as a technical working group amongst the nations, um, guided by the province and also assisted by uh, a consultant to help facilitate this process. We drafted this document, which would feed into the negotiating process from an ecosystem function point of view. And the purpose of this was to, to compile some goals and objectives and these performance measures, and also to under, understand what are some areas that we don't have information on. We call these data gaps that uh, will help uh, guide further research to sort of uh, you know, help us steer along. Um, and that feeds right into the negotiations. So how do we do this? Uh, like I said, we've got a consultant that helps facilitate. Uh, we've got the indigenous working groups, which uh, we have uh, all three nations uh, um, uh, present. Uh, myself, uh, technical sort of leads, those that are, that are knowledgeable in the fisheries and the upland, the wildlife, all sorts of things to, to feed into this. Uh, and then once we've had this drafted and we're at that point now that we can shop it out to the agencies for peer review. So we need some real critical input into this. And then we can identify priorities. Um, one of the main things is also climate change, our hydrological cycle, our inputs, our water inputs, uh, those things have, have changed significantly. So we really need to be cognizant and, and include that. And it's a work in process, right? So uh, we've taken our, be our best, uh, best approach. I'm gonna go through some of our themes and goals. And um, please, uh, you've got a form. There's a form in front of you that describes the ecosystem function with the goals and objectives. So if something comes to mind, if we've missed something, or if uh, this is an opportunity to criti critique and suggest. So. So in terms of just general goals, and I'm just gonna try and uh, work through this. There's, there's quite a bit of detail that, that's hidden in, the, in, in these elements. So, um, so some general goals, we wanna improve ecosystem function. I think we're all on the same page there. We want stability in the reservoir operations because we've got actually, there's uh, if we start to look at all the different ecosystem functions, we might have competing interests within those elements of ecosystem function, you know, fish versus, uh, you know, wildlife in some cases. So we've, we've, we're very cognizant of that. But we ultimately want to strive for balance. We want to find out what's the best scenario that's going to work for a thriving ecosystem. So here are some of our ecosystem function themes. Um, you can imagine we had this, this session where we're all kind of brainstorming and the, the shotgun approach to put all these different, and there's literally hundreds of elements to an ecosystem, of course. So we tried to boil it down and we wanted to put it into to bins. You know, we like to compartmentalize things, but we don't want to lose, lose the focus of the details, but it was important to kind of 
put it into certain bins. So see, there's, these are some of the themes. These are the major themes that, that came out of that exercise. So ecosystem productivity, floodplain, riparian wetlands, uh, riverine and reservoir ecosystems, and anadromous species. Um, these are sort of different bubbles, but they are all interconnected and we are, we're very cognizant of that. Like some elements of a certain theme will, will feed into, um, into others. So from this, we've got uh, 13 goals and associated objectives. So you can maybe follow along in the, uh, in the, in the handout there. So let's get to the, the nitty gritty. So ecosystem productivity. So this is uh, the primary, secondary and tertiary uh, uh, elements of an ecosystem. So when we're talking about these, these bits of jargon, we're talking about the things that kick us off, like the plants that uptake nutrients, that uh, provide food uh, for um, like invertebrates, bugs, that sort of thing. And then we have the top end, things that ultimately consume the plants, ungulates or fish that eat the little, the little bugs or, or other little fish. So that's sort of our that food web, food chain type, type approach. Um, both for, uh, for the upslope, so that's outside of the, the wetted edge, uh, floodplain, riparian wetland, and of course the same applies to aquatic habitats. So there's productivity, primary production, secondary production, etc., within aquatic environments. So we want to capture that in productivity. Um, floodplains, riparian wetland ecosystems, our second theme. So essentially we want to increase area, the, the amount of habitat in these functioning habitats. Um, and we also want to include uh, connectivity between and among habitats. So moving on into uh, the third theme, reservoir and riverine ecosystems. Uh, we want to manage flows to achieve uh, geofluvial processes. So this is <laughs> what what the heck is that? And, and normative flows. So getting lost in the jargon, again, this is essentially uh, the sediment and uh, the particles in a river system that are moved by water. So we want to understand those dynamics and try and get it back to a, a more of a baseline, what they call normative um, uh, scenario. Uh, moving on to uh, increase and improve functional free-flowing riverine main stem habitats. Uh, including seasonal availability of uh, critical species, life history, dependent habitats. So what we've understood so far is that as we operate the, uh, the discharges from a lot of these dams, we have species that are, are, are very much impacted. Uh, the lower Columbia River, for example, we've got uh, uh, rainbow trout protection flows. We've got whitefish protection flows to protect those species at sensitive times. So that's an interesting step that sort of um, guides us, if you will, towards ecosystem function in the broader scale of the, the basin. Continuing on uh, with the third theme there, goal C, uh, access and connectivity. Uh, talking mostly from the, the drawdown zone point of view, as, as the reservoir drops, those, those streams that come in, you know, they become braided and that sort of thing. And we want to take a closer look at how uh, uh, fish moving up to those, those tributaries have access. Improve water chemistry, um, dam operations sometimes uh, impact uh, water quality. Uh, total dissolved gases is one prime example where you've got high discharge rates from a high elevation that, that super saturate water and, uh, um, and train gases into the, into the water. And as fish try and respire in that environment, they may succumb to um, the gas bubble disease and that sort of thing. So very conscious of water quality. Uh, surface water temperatures, when we're dealing with um, our cold water environment here in the basin, some fish, particularly bull trout, are very, very sensitive to in slight increases in water temperature. So that's an element that we've included. Um, fish mortality, particularly in fish stranding, as we, we, we look at the, the operating re regimes, reservoirs are dropped. Habitat is exposed, fish are exposed, and also in the riverine sections where we have these different ramping rates, we see uh, fish mortality. So we're gonna take a closer look at that. Uh, anadromous species. So the anadromous is, is uh, ocean going. So a fish that as part of its life cycle completes, completes it in the ocean. Salmon are, are the sort of one of the hallmark species that travel thousands of kilometers and, and mature as adults in the ocean and then return to their uh, natal streams. Uh, we want to maximize the flows to, uh, for anadromous species. 
And uh, goal A and goal B are very closely linked to the Okanagan salmon uh, recovery story. So thinking, why the Okanagan River? Well, the Okanagan River comes into the Columbia just below Chief Joseph Dam. And that's uh, just above the ninth dam from the ocean where passage happens through those nine dams and have access to the Okanagan River. So flow management that happens here goes through Chief uh, Grand Coulee and Chief Joe and then impacts the in-migration of Okanagan bound salmon as well as out-migrating smolt. And um, we also are very interested in Chinook recovery in the Okanagan system. So we're looking at biodiversity, we're looking at increased abundance, biomass condition, and that is to, to really allow the, the Okanagan indigenous fishery to flourish. And then getting back to our, our LOA, the, uh, the last goal of anadromous salmon is, uh, is the Upper Columbia initiative to restore salmon to, to the block parts in Canada. Uh, in terms of flexibility, uh, much has to be learned about integrating ecosystem function into uh, hydro operations. We're going to be learning through studies, uh, scenario modeling, and the active adaptive management. And learning is obviously a process, right? So this is going to be iterative and adaptive. We're going to go through a series of, uh, of studies and uh, have feedback um, to see if we're really getting at, at those goals. So next steps, you're part of the process. Uh, we're looking for impact, uh, feedback from, from you. Um, you've got that form. Uh, also, perhaps an opportunity to have more uh, robust discussion. And uh, there's an online um, survey component that's been pointed out already. But in terms of where we are from the, the technical working group's point of view, we've, got, we've, we've narrowed down this ecosystem function, the goals and objectives, and defined 14 uh, major studies to start addressing questions. And we have a deadline of, I believe, June of, of 2020 to start to, to, to pull that all together, see what information we have that will fulfill those, those gaps, and as well as other studies that, that we can design to, to, to get at things that we still don't know. Um, and then run through some of, the, some of the computer simulations to see how those, uh, those um, different um, ecosystem themes um, respond to different scenarios. And then we'll be putting it all together in a, in a, and reporting out and, and sharing that with, uh, with the public and others. That's all I have for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome, Michael. Um, don't, don't go anywhere. We do have time for some questions. So does anybody have any questions or comments for Mike on his work? In the back. All right, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick question for you, Michael. Um, so these are uh, objectives uh, that were compiled by the First Nations in Canada. Would the American tribes uh, endorse all of these goals and objectives? I think we're at that process where we formulated that document and we've we sent it out so that's a that's a really good question we haven't um um they haven't really been part of the the, the that te te technical working group uh, this side of the border but that information is going to flow south and uh we are going to be talking about some of this at the lake roosevelt forum coming up next week so there is going to be ample opportunity to to dis discuss some of that i can speak a little bit to the salmon LOA piece as it's sort of wrapped in the anadromous salmon picture and that salmon LOA, uh, one of the bits that I didn't really talk about is one of the guiding documents to that was that joint fish passage paper that was prepared in 2015, which is uh, the 15 tribes and bands uh, south of the 49th and the three Canadian First Nations that collaborated on that joint fish passage paper. And in that, there's a multi-phase, uh, three or four phase approach to salmon reintroduction. So we all collaborated on that. Um, so like a transboundary uh, effort on that. But that's just one piece. So 
I think when, once we go through the, the Lake Roosevelt Forum and, and have those discussions, it, it, it will certainly be an open and robust discussion. What I'm hearing is, is that they're sort of, they're thinking along the same lines. So I, I don't think there's going to be any major surprises, but we're, we're open for, for that uh, either way. So. Another question in the back here. Uh, my question is relating to the hydro generation. You mentioned that right at the end as a small little item, but yet I think all the funding for any of these projects for um, ecosystem are going to be funded out of that. And we're facing a, a Clean BC Act. We're facing a move away from using fossil fuels in Canada. We may, we're moving towards electric hydro generation and other clean sources. Um, I think we've, we're, we're ignoring the facts that the U.S. are going to turn around and say we, because they're not, they're not interested in what we're doing in terms of a green environment or um, uh, power generation. And I think we're going to end up uh, you know, facing a difficult negotiation in trying to keep the funding sources, which I believe is what's funding this move towards uh, ecosystem. Um, my question is really is what, you know, let's assume we didn't have any of these dams. W would we be having any of these discussions today? Because, in, you know, climate issues are changing what the fish and the ecology, whether we like it or not. So if I'm hearing you right, if we didn't have the dams, would we be having these discussions? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, we look at uh, other other systems that have, you know, like a Fraser, our neighboring major watershed that that isn't impeded or isn't regulated, and um, you know, you can use that as as an example in terms of a thriving uh, anadromous uh, connected system where salmon migrate all the way up. I think we were chatting with some folks from Vailmont, you know, that seeing Fraser River salmon spawn at you know in the foothills of of Mount Robson. And uh, the benefits, you know, there's a lot of benefits from salmon migrating upstream. You know, one of them that comes to mind is, is uh, the nutrient cycling, right? And that's one thing that we don't have uh, currently now with a block system. We have a nutrient supplementation program that sort of tries to maybe get at some of the impacts of those dams and not necessarily the salmon, the marine derived nutrient loss, but um, we can compare those two systems anyway. So, yeah, I don't know if we'd really be having these these discussions so is there good could you talk about the whoosh system and uh, how often it's been used and it's been tested and if it's effective or does it dam is a do they know if it'll damage the salmon they transport it yeah good question about the whoosh uh, whoosh innovations um Coincidentally, we were invited down to a, um, a demonstration down at Chief Joseph Dam uh, later this summer, I think it was September, where they had it set up uh, uh, below Chief Joseph Dam. So Chief Joseph is the 10th dam and, a, and the first block. Um, they've been working a little bit with the Colville tribes down there. The Colville tribes have a, uh, a Chinook uh, salmon recovery program. They have a hatchery down there. So it was a good, good site to, to, to test that. Um, the big thing is, is physics. So you're trying to overcome uh, dams that are like four or five, 600 feet high and the lead up time to get a certain object over that height without losing it, without gravity uh, pulling you back down. So they've been doing a lot of testing and what they found at Chief Joseph is that they could, they could um, get fish up and over. They didn't do a live, live test at the time. But in other places, Clay Ellum Dam, and I can't remember which, which watershed that's on, somewhere in the, in the Columbia system, they had successful tests there. Does it hurt the fish? They've done extensive studies on that. It's just a, it's just a vinyl tube, like a, a, like a pool liner that's suspended, and they have a, 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 just a low negative pressure that draws them through, like one or two pounds per inch. They keep it wetted inside. There's sprays, so the, the, you know, every, the fish stays wet, and it creates a seal. And within a matter of, I don't, can't remember the, the distance, like 30 seconds to move uh, 100 feet or a couple hundred feet. Uh, and then the fish come out of the end of the can. That's where they get the nickname, the salmon cannon. Because if you go to YouTube and look up whoosh, you'll, you'll be totally entertained by, <laughs> by, by what it does. And the fish blast out of this thing as if they were uh, jumping over a natural obstruction. So they come out of this thing and they, they swim. They, it's like 
trying to jump a falls. They know that when they, as soon as they hit the water, they got to turn on the jets to make this obstruction. So it's very interesting behavior to see. And they've done extensive studies on, on, the, on the effect of that and it's, it's next to zero. So nothing discernible in terms of impact. So the applicability, um, the cost, it's very effective. It's very mobile. So it's an interesting innovation that could have applicability here. And there's other technologies like trap and, trap and haul, fish ladders, fish lifts, those sorts of things. So it's just one, one little tool, I suppose, that, that shows significant promise. Great. Any other questions or comments? A Selkirk student quiet. <laughs> uh, maybe what we'll do at this point then is uh, take five minutes or so at your tables and um, talk amongst yourselves about what you've just heard from Michael uh, and you know whether you think that this work, whether the goals and objectives identified and, and the direction this work is going in the right direction up via Uwush Cannon, or if uh, there's anything missing, anything that you think should be added or, or otherwise considered. Um, and we'll come back and, and share kind of your key thoughts that come to mind after that. Uh, and then once we're done with our table conversations, uh, we will finish our evening with um, my colleague Ingrid talking about some of the really important projects that the province is working on to address key community interests. So let's have a conversation with ourselves here at the tables. Uh, we'll call us all back in about five minutes or so and, and carry on. Thank